and welcome to the AAKP session on disease management, disrupting disease progression through community engagement. I'm Sarah Eve Schaefer, an AAKP Board of Director member and Executive Director for the Kidney Transplant Learning Collaborative, a contract under CMS and HRSA. I'm involved with AAKP because with the complexities of kidney disease and treatment, AAKP focuses on the empowerment of the individual and the patient community, which is so important to lasting change. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Barry Smith, a fellow AAKP Board of Director and founder of the Dreyfus Health Policy and Research Center. Dr. Smith's clinical interests involve patient care as well as basic and clinical research issues related to chronic illness and its cost to the U.S. healthcare system. Throughout his esteemed career, he continued to further develop latter interests, especially those related to population health and the prevention of chronic illnesses, including kidney disease. As Director of Dreyfus Health Policy and Research Center, Dr. Smith has worked with his colleagues on the development and implementation of community-based primary health programs in more than 32 countries. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Smith. The floor is yours. Thank you, AAKP, uh, for the privilege of being able to be here today to present a message on how we can prevent community disease, each of us in the community, and uh, how we can slow the progression of kidney disease. So I have an exciting message for you today, and I'm delighted to be here to present it through AAKP. Now, we all know the stages of kidney disease, but I wanna go through them again, because we can start with normal, which is how we most of us uh, live until we have a, a problem. And then with things like type two diabetes, hypertension, vascular disease, and so forth, we enter into the stages of kidney disease, which end up in stages four and five, and of course, with stage five with dialysis and transplant. And what we wanna focus on today is what we can do in stages one to four, and even before stage one, when our kidneys are so-called normally functioning to uh, prevent kidney disease. And then in the other stages, talk about slowing the progression. I don't know how often you think of the healthcare system. I think of it often because I think one of the things that we, we miss is how important what happens in what I would call before access to the healthcare system in the community, in your home, in my home, as individuals, as families, what we can do that makes a difference. Because once we get into the, the system with primary care, the clinics, the inpatient, the outpatient stays. That's an important part of the story, but we wanna to see today what we can do before we ever get there. So the question we're asking is, can, can community engagement, can what we do in the community, in our homes, make a difference in the prevention and the progression of kidney disease? And I think what I'd like to take for you to take home as a message today is community engagement as a secret ingredient, and we hope it's not secret anymore after today, for better health. Because at home, in the community, is where we can prevent chronic diseases and slow those diseases that have occurred, like chronic kidney disease. And to, to tell you the story today, what I wanna do is talk to you about something that's happened and happening in Brooklyn, New York. We call it the Rise Up East New York Campaign for Better Health and Quality of Life for Everyone. Now, East New York is uh, not surprisingly in the eastern part of, of Brooklyn. It's an area that has been underserved for a great many, uh, many years. It's a low income area, it is a high disease rate, and I'll show you some of those facts just to paint a picture of uh, where we are and uh, why the community engagement is so important. Some basic statistics, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Think of it, obesity, virtually one in every three people in East New York and Star City, that's really part of the same thing. One in three people. Diabetes, a little higher than uh, New York City on the whole, but if you compare it with Greenwich Village and Soho, uh, 3% versus 14%. And then hypertension, again, we're talking about one in three people who have this. So it's a, it's a setup for kidney disease 
uh, as you all know. These are things that precede kidney disease and uh, lead to it. Other problems are there as well. Psychiatric hospitalizations are roughly twice what they are in uh, all of Brooklyn. And if you compare it to the lowest part of Brooklyn, they're about almost five times, uh, just about five times higher. So this is an area of high stress and difficult, difficult living. And if you look at the causes of premature death in East New York, again, you can see the great uh, imbalance. Overall rate of 264.8 versus 169.5 for New York City as a whole. And of course, that's a high figure compared to many of the areas. But you look at cancer, you look at heart disease, you look at diabetes, HIV infections, and of course, homicide, they're all higher than uh, the city average and much higher than some parts of the city. And if you look at life expectancy, and I, this won't surprise you, but it, it's impressive. Overall, it's about 2.6 years shorter than the average for New York City. But if you look very carefully at some areas, say in Manhattan, we're talking as much as seven to 10 years shorter. Now, this is largely an African-American uh, community, and the, the young men in this community say these are young men 30 to 40 uh, years of age. That is when they are developing diabetes, hypertension, uh, these obesity, these problems that we don't see in the parts of Manhattan, for example, that are largely well-to-do, uh, largely uh, white populations. It's as much as 10 years later for them to develop these same conditions. So you can see where we've uh, drawn the red uh, line around it. In East New York, it's a very different, very different situation. So the question is, what can be done? I think one of the important things is we, we have to realize that health although we tend to treat it as a separate entity, uh, you know, it's, it's not related to the other things we do. In fact, health is really a complex product of not only the biological and genetic factors that we would all understand, but it's a combination of those with societal factors, employment, the food that's available, housing, education, transportation, you can make a whole long list uh, and it includes things like depression, which may be much higher in prevalence in a community like this because of all the problems people have to do with every day. And I like the definition of health that the World Health Organization provided in 1948. Uh, it's a long time ago, but it uh, is a terrific definition. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In fact, what we're talking about is wellness, because you can have good health or bad health, but what we want for everyone is, is wellness. And I would emphasize again that health is not this thing off on the side that we go see the doctor about. It's not something separate unto itself, rather it's part of our whole living situation. And we can have better health if our living situation is better, and we can have worse health without the biology being really very different if, uh, if we're in a bad living situation. Now, if you talk about the people of East New York, and I, I wanna use this as an example, when you do a community needs assessment survey, so-called, and the last one of these was done in 2017, but there is a new one uh, that's just about to be done. People don't talk about health. What do they see as their big problems? Housing, assistance with housing, housing security, prevention of eviction, food and nutrition assistance, legal services, emergency shelter, financial assistance, you can see them there, education and employment. Those are the things they worry about. And they, like the rest of us, don't really think of health as being affected by those things. But in fact, it is. And our wellness and quality of life is very much a function of those things. 
So what Rise Up East New York is trying to do is work on this principle or build on this principle of true health as a product of society. And East New York is really a model of this. And we need partnerships to, to create greater impact. And I want to bring out something which I think is very important. We're all hearing much more of this term, social determinants of health. And I think we need to change that into social opportunities for change for better health. Because if your housing is bad, if your stress level is, is high, if you are struggling to uh, maintain and paying your rent, uh, those are stresses, of course, but, and we think of them as determinants. But when you say determinants, it sounds as though it's fixed and we can't do anything about it. I think these are where the opportunities lie to change for better health. And these things have to be community led and community driven. And I think whether you're relatively well off in your own home and it's lovely and so forth, but there's some stresses in your life, you need to deal with those things. Uh, and if your situation is very bad, of course, as it may be in, in a housing in East New York, then it's very important to deal with those things. So these are not determinants but they're opportunities for change, for the better. And in all of our lives, we need to seize those opportunities. Now, why are we in East New York? Why do we think it's so important to be there? Well, I've already described some of the problems in East New York, discrimination, inequity, redlining, which is where stores wouldn't come to East New York because the people were, were poor and it was a difficult situation. Income is low typically 20 to 30,000 per year. High chronic disease prevalence, we've always talked about. If you live in bad housing, the kids have asthma. That's a real problem because the housing, the air quality is poor. The other thing is that people don't trust the healthcare system. The healthcare system has not worked for them in the, in the past. They get treated differently than other people do in other parts of the city and even other people within their community. But the other side of it is there's some wonderful opportunities here. They're wonderful, bright and intelligent people. As I said, largely an African-American culture, but a terrific one, rich, warm culture. They have this wonderful philosophy, which uh, I think many of us in other communities could benefit from. I am my brother's sister or keeper. In other words, we take care of one another and they have a passion for bettering the community they live in and improving the level of quality of, of life. They have some wonderful resources like 57 gardens that I believe could supply fruits and fresh fruits and vegetables for all the citizens, about 200,000 people in, in East New York. They've got strong political leadership. Uh, at all levels, city, state, and federal. They have social opportunities for change for better health. They have them in abundance and they need to be seized. They're inhibitory factors though, and it's not so easy. We're talking now again, this pre-access community before we get these diseases or where we can slow down the progression of the ones we do have. As I already said, health is not a real priority for the people. They don't see it as part of it. So one of the things we wanna do is educate them uh, about that. And that means uh, bringing knowledge into the, the community about the seriousness of the health problems, but also what's contributing to those problems. And then I think there's a key word here. They don't have a trust in the present healthcare system. And there, though there are many wonderful community-based organizations trying to do good things, their efforts are siloed. That is to say, they don't work well with each other because each one of them has to survive. So there are a large number of factors. Perhaps most important is how do we make health a priority when someone doesn't have a job or can't pay the rent? They, they just, they can't afford to worry about those or eat a better meal. So we've started the education campaign. Uh, this is a, uh, an example of something on our, our website to bring attention to these diseases and to saying, look, we're not bringing you solutions 
what we want to do is work together with you to find the right solutions that fit the way you live and the way you eat and so forth so we can make make the difference together. Mobilizing the community is, is the crucial thing to do here. It's critical to success for the people. And in this slide, I, I like it very much because the woman in front in the, the white t-shirt is a woman with polycystic kidney disease. She's been on 12 years of dialysis. She now has a transplant. Right behind her is Assemblyman Charles Barron, uh, who is New York State Assemblyman, and he has some power to change things. And behind him is his wife, who is a city, Inez uh, Barron, who is a city council member. But working together, people with the problems and the pol political leaders, the city leaders, the state leaders, and so forth, this is how the difference is going to be made. And it's by mobilizing everybody at every level. People often think, say obesity is not such a big deal. Well, one of the education pieces we've put together for the people of East New York is on obesity because I don't believe most people, including people like me, realize just how serious the, the problem is. Uh, it's a worldwide uh, problem. Uh, more than a billion people have it <clears throat> worldwide, well over a billion people. and some 90 million Americans or 42% of our population live with obesity. It's higher in the United States than any other comparable economically developed country. And the problem is not simply confined to adults, but 14% of children, 20% of six to 19 year olds are obese. And in the next slide, we see that <clears throat> There's more to this problem than meets the eye. This is just to remind you that it's very high in East New York, higher than anywhere else in the country, really. Obesity does a lot of things and we don't realize this. For example, obesity inhibits the T cells, the immune cells in the body that actually work to prevent and kill cancer. So cancer is a greater risk in an obese person. Obesity inhibits fertility, so it's a reproductive health problem. The brain development of the fetus. In New York City, 80% of the COVID hospitalizations were due to, well, 80% of the hospitalizations, I should say, were due to COVID in obese people. So obesity is a serious problem. We have to teach people about it because it leads to kidney disease. So what we've done is start a fitness program for people in the community. There's a youth football program, which is not really about football, but more about the discipline that it takes and the teaching of teamwork. But it's putting programs together like this for adults and children to change things. And this is going to prevent kidney disease in this population. We pass out literature as well, so people can learn that there is something to be concerned about. If you don't want to have kidney disease, this is something to control. And if you do have kidney disease, controlling overweight, even if it's not frank obesity, is very important because you, again, you can slow the progression of disease. So when we have a formal weight reduction program that we've put in place for people who are particularly heavy to to lose a large amount of body weight, to reduce body mass index, it's called, to make them healthier uh, people. And that's ongoing right now. And just to make the point for all of us that lifestyle factors can be modified to prevent CKD, chronic kidney disease. And this was a group of investigators who got together 104 studies of almost 3 million people, 2,755,000 people, to look at ways you could prevent CKD without medication. So the first thing they looked at was dietary intake of vegetables and potassium. If you increase that, what did it do? Well, there was a 21% reduction in the odds of getting kidney disease. If you increase physical activity levels, 18%. If you reduced alcohol consumption, it was 15%. And I think everybody would know that stopping smoking was a good idea. But the point is, 
we can change our risk of kidney disease by the way we live. We get rid of obesity, we control the hypertension, we control the diabetes. Those are very important things to remember. We have a lot of control over what happens to us. Working in East New York, our critical task was that we had to become trusted and true members, not just trusted, but true members of the community. And that has gone well, and we're beginning to see more and more of a distant difference as people come to us and ask us questions and say, how, I can, how can I change this? But you have to remember as well, let's go on to the next slide. You have to do a lot of things that health, it's not simply a matter of going to the doctor and getting your blood sugar checked or your blood pressure checked. And so we built a model that really responds to this total health question. Now the community and being engaged, as you can see in the center of this slide is the most critical element of all. And we can't do everything ourselves, so we get partners in all these areas. So we need business, we need insurers, we need sanitation, we need the faith-based institutions. We need the unions, for example, that have jobs to offer or the small businesses or the large businesses. Right now, for example, there's a plethora of, there are a plethora of jobs and uh, nobody seems to be taking them. There are a lot of problems. You can't work if you don't have childcare. So there are a lot of things to think about. So we need to work together with the nonprofits and even some of the for-profits to put together a system that'll really change lives. And basic screening is important. You need to check certain things like the blood pressure, like the level of the blood sugar, like the creatinine in the case of kidney disease. And we need to be able to risk stratify people and say, hey, you're at particular risk, and so we want you to get taken care of early on before you develop stage three or stage four kidney disease when you know that's more difficult to deal with. So risk stratification is very important. And again, we've talked about community education. These are all the elements of the program. And very interestingly, we found that one of the most important things we could do was produce a calendar of all the things going on in the community, health fairs, uh, job fairs, uh, nutrition classes, whatever it is, so everybody knows what, what's in the community and they can take advantage of it because there is a lot available. Even if you're busy and you're stressed, you can take advantage of some of these things. The list of partners is incredible. I've already talked about this. The key is in the center, it's the community itself but we're working with the grocery stores to be sh and the small bodegas, for example, the little stores, the delis and so forth, to get them to think about how they can sell healthier foods. But they still have to stay in business and we recognize that as a problem. But every aspect of the community has to be brought in, the education system, the transportation and so forth, because health is a complex product of all of this. Education is critical just general education, not just the health education. So as I said before, and I think it's an important lesson for all of us, we talk about the social determinants of health and in a way it's a kind of excuse. We say, well, it's a determinant that's fixed as I said earlier, and that means we can't do anything about it. But I really think not only in this community, but for our lives generally, where are the opportunities we can seize to to make our health better and prevent kidney disease, manage diabetes, re prevent hypertension, prevent that obesity, all of that's very important. Now, you know, nutrition in East New York is a real problem. In the, the African-American history, a lot of the food habits that are established and the kinds of food that are eaten were set back when the time of slavery. And many of those things were not healthy, Not some of them are healthy and we need to emphasize those, but it makes a point that changing our diets for all of us, because we, we've grown accustomed to particular things can be difficult. But New York, East New York has the added problem that there aren't any grocery stores to speak of. You talk about the bodegas, these small stores that often sell very unhealthy foods because they're profitable and people have to stay in business and we understand that but there are 13 of those to one supermarket. 
And that's where I mentioned the gardens of East New York. One of the things we're working on is trying to get them coordinated so they can produce the healthy vegetables that you can't get in a supermarket or even, and certainly in the bodegas, but even if you can get them, they're very expensive and often they're of poor quality. They're out of date, they're old, and they're not attractive. So this is another kind of problem that needs to be worked on. We all need to watch our diets, but it's very hard if you can't get access to the healthy foods. People need jobs. So we've been working with, as I said, businesses, but also with the unions where training opportunities are available so people can get trained, say, and this, and this one shows as a union carpenter and get a good job. We need to think about that. That's an important part of people's health and that's economic stability. If you don't have that and security, you're in trouble. And again, we're passing out more literature in general, not just about specific health problems, but about living in a healthy way, something we can all afford to think about and read and learn about in our own community and our own way of living. How can we make it healthier? COVID is a big issue right now, so we've gotten a lot of information out to the community. Uh, unfortunately, in Brooklyn, the immunization rate is still quite low in the 35 to 40 percent range, whereas the city as a, a whole is closer to 60 percent. How to solve that problem? And in the next slide, you'll see the other side of this flyer, which is talking about the vaccine, but also talking about the mask how to wear it, why it's important to do so, because a lot of people in the community, and there was one politician who said, I don't want the vaccine. Uh, that's only the pharmaceutical companies making a profit. So here's somebody who's a leader expressing his distrust of the whole system. That's one of the reasons the problems are so bad in communities like this. So again, just to review what we're doing, we're doing basic health screening and education and risk stratification, working with the hospital system, the New York Blood Center, whatever we can do to be sure people are healthy. We have a medical anchor. There's a good hospital, new hospital system there. There are private clinics. There are a variety of systems, but we wanna get people who are identified as being at high risk into the system early so they don't get the late stage diseases, which are again, so difficult to deal with. Now, if you have a question, you say, that's fine. You're talking about a, a model and a community that is a terrific community and is gonna make change, but what if I already have chronic kidney disease stages two to four? Is there anything I can do to slow the progression of my kidney disease? A great question. I think the answer is a very resounding yes. You can work with your physician to control your diabetes or hypertension. You can change your nutrition, watch your weight, consistent and appropriate physical activity, take good care of yourself and look for new treatments that may help. You know, there are things coming new all the time. And I wanna to bring to your attention some really exciting possibilities that are out there right now. There's a class of drugs called the SGLT2 inhibitors. And the SGLT is a glucose transporter mechanism. It moves sugar in and out of, uh, out of cells, you might say. So it transports it. And it turns out that the inhibitors, which have been initially used in diabetes, have turned out to be very good in preventing, well, really more slowing, pre preventing the progression of chronic kidney disease. So the next slide, We'll show you one of those. Uh, Dapagliflozin is one that's out there right now. It's uh, commercially available as far as she goes. I'm not, not pushing any drugs, but it's in interesting to me that the compound that originally gave rise to the concept of these inhibitors came from the bark of an apple tree. So it was a, a natural molecule and these other molecules have been synthetically designed after that. The problem with the apple tree bark was that it, it was not absorbable in the body, so it really couldn't be used as a, a drug. But this is very important because as we'll see in the next slide, some of the things it can do. So at the top, you see in patients with CKD, what do these inhibitors do? Well, they reduce the dec decline in glomerular filtration rate, they reduce overall chronic kidney or end-stage kidney, the likelihood of end-stage kidney disease. 
They reduce the cardiovascular death that's associated or heart failure hospitalizations that are associated with uh, chronic kidney disease. They decrease mortality in CKD. And then in the bottom, it also works on uh, heart failure ejection fraction. And you see, again, it has a very positive effect. So the key point is there are things out there that have come along that are useful and can make a difference even if you do have chronic kidney disease stages two to four at this point. So you need to look and talk to your doctor about what might be available and appropriate. Not everything's appropriate for everybody, so you have to be careful, but there are things coming along and I think that's very encouraging. I wanna just give you an example. Eric Adams, who is uh, won the Democratic primary for mayor of New York and New York being a uh, largely democratic city is very likely to uh, win the mayoral uh, contest in November against Curtis Sliwa, had type two diabetes and he was going blind. What did he do? He changed his diet to a plant-based diet. He started to exercise regularly and basically he reversed his eyesight problems and no longer needs any medication for type two diabetes. As he says, I cured myself. So it's an example, a very good example. He's a great guy, he used to be a cop in New York City. <laughs> He's come a long way up through the Senate. He's currently borough president as the slide says, but we can do much more by taking care of ourselves and doing it well. And you know we want to put all this together and, and get the word out around the country. That's what the Center of Excellence in East New York will try to do as we have success and so forth. But uh, that's a, for another time and we won't talk about it more today. I want to finish with the point by including community engagement. That's what you and I can do. Screening and early intervention. We need the doctors and the nurse practitioners and the system to get some of those things done. But what we want to do, I think, for all of us is work toward a health and healthcare system. It's not simply based on diagnosing and treating sickness. We need to do that and we'll continue to need to do that as long as people like me are getting older. But also one that maintains a system that maintains wellness and slows disease progression. And that's one we hear a lot about equity. That's the kind of system that'll produce the equity that we'd, we'd all like to see for everyone. Well, what all of this means is that you can do a huge amount to protect your kidneys and those of your family. You're the key person. I love this expression, take care of your kidneys and they will take care of you. Very true, very important. So I hope you can see from what we've said today that treating yourself well, what you can do before you're in, in the health system or when you're outside of it is critically important to one, preventing chronic kidney disease and then end stage kidney disease, but is also the way that you can slow the progression of kidney disease. So you have to be the one to take action. Thank you AAKP for the opportunity to present this message of how we can prevent kidney disease by us as individuals and working together as a community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for an insightful presentation on the ability to disrupt disease progression with programs and engagement at the community level. We hope your presentation serves as a model for other community health systems to implement. Thank you again for sharing your time and expertise.